Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, hear the word of the Lord. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the des desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. People love work. We love it because it gives us money and meaning. It gives us cash so we can get the food we want, the place to live, the phones we're obsessed with. It gives us an identity. Many people, you know, don't say, I do such and such. I teach, I bake, I edit, but I often say, I am such as if I'm a teacher, I'm a baker, I'm an editor. Even if they don't love their job, they love the money that it gives them. They love the things that their job enables them to do. Uh, we even call it, what do we call it? Making a living. People hate work. We hate it because it gets dreary. The same old grind, call it, you know, put your nose to the grindstone. There's so many other things we'd rather be doing, relaxing, watching a game at the beach, playing ball. They hate the alarm clock, the hamster and the wheel feeling like they're running and running and getting nowhere. They're dirty jobs. The childish think, you know, if there are things I love to do and I hate work, well, then why work? I want to stay home and play video games or go play ball all day. Why, why go do a job or even worse, go to a boring school to learn how to do a job later on? And sometimes kids need to be given chores so that they'll learn that they, you got to work. You're going to have to work whether they hate it or not. You know, that yard is not gonna mow itself. Those dishes are not gonna wash themselves. People love and hate work. Work doesn't just provide money, it provides meaning. Personal identity and employment often go together. More often than not, the first question you get asked when you meet someone is, what do you do? What you do, many people assume, is, is who, you are, who you are. So if you're doing nothing, many people begin to feel that they are nothing. They get depressed. Work gives them a sense of adding something to the world. You know, I'm the person who delivers this mail or builds this building, teaches these kids, cooks this food, edits this magazine, repairs these cars, takes care of these patients, makes this place or this program work, cleans this house. There are, there are products from me in this world, manifestations of my presence to show that I was here. This task I accomplished or, or thing I produced is something that I can hold in my hand as proof that I am somebody. But without a job, with nothing in your hand, people often suffer feelings of anxiety, panic, depression, or just a bored dreariness. I produce nothing. I'm paid nothing. I am nothing, they think. People love and hate work. And it's the same with religion. We want to work, at least some, want to have something to show for ourselves, something in our hands we can bring to God, something to boast about. We assume that God loves or at least demands, like a tough boss, our work. But what does he really demand? And by the way, what's God's work? Well, we see that here in these first 10 verses of Ephesians chapter 2. In three parts, first, bad work, second, God's work, and finally, our work. Well, people want to work, but when it comes to God, to pleasing and obeying him, they can't. That, that's a work that they're not capable of doing because he says, Paul says in verse one, you there, you look at the verse, hear that? Look at the verse. Verse one, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. That is we live a life of crossing God's boundaries 
He said, do not covet, but we covet. We live for money or we live for things or relationships or thrills. And so we sin. And that kind of life, Paul says, we're dead. That's our condition before God, dead. This is the doctrine of total depravity. Now, I've seen people who deny total depravity, when we come to this verse, say, well, we're exaggerating what it says. What it says about human nature, we're exaggerating it. But I don't see how you can exaggerate dead. I think dead is about the worst condition you can be in, I assume. I don't know much about medicine, but I'm pretty sure of that. If a doctor came to you and said, I don't want to, I don't want to alarm you, but, but I don't want to exaggerate the severity of his condition, but uh, he's dead. Well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Medically dead, I assume, is as bad as you can get. Once you're diagnosed as dead, they aren't going to diagnose you with anything worse. Okay? It's not going to get worse from there. There isn't a category lower than dead. The dead body lacks any power in itself to help itself. It can't recuperate. Medicine and bed rest won't help. Doctors don't send dead people back home. I'll let him rest a while. Maybe he'll get over it. Physical therapy doesn't help on the dead. Time will not heal the wounds of death. Being dead is the worst condition, the one of absolute hopelessness, at least hopeless that the dead can help themselves. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying about people who are in their trespasses and sins rather than being in Christ. The lost are dead. They're hopeless. They have no power in themselves to help themselves. It's like a corpse. It won't respond. It won't recover to treatment. It won't, no matter what you treat it with, the corpse is not going to recover in itself. Spiritually, it's as bad as you can get. There's no diagnosis more severe than that which has been given to us. D-O-A. Dead on arrival. But what does it mean to be spiritually dead? After all, unbelievers can do good things things, at least from our point of view. They can be nice. Some believers can be nice. They can, be, they can give. They can be faithful. They can be good citizens. They can be good neighbors. There's plenty of unbelievers. I don't mind having is my neighbors. I used to pass by a Buddhist-free clinic in Singapore. They certainly were believers in the Lord Jesus. They were Buddhist, but they gave their time and the money to help people's medical problems. So how can, it, how can they be, like here, dead in their trespasses and sins? Because being spiritually dead is being dead to God. Like a physically dead person is dead to physical things. He's unresponsive physically, unable to do physical things, like play basketball, walk, breathe. So a spiritually dead person is unresponsive spiritually, unable to do spiritual things, like believe. He or she can't hear the voice of God. The eyes of his heart are, are blind. He or she can't respond with faith and love can't obey God's commands. Now, he or she may end up doing what God commands. He might not murder anyone. He might be faithful to his wife, might not steal, might not lie, he might be a helpful neighbor, but he's not doing those things out of faith in the Lord, out of love for the Lord. But maybe he's doing it for whatever, whatever reason, because he, maybe he's just reasoned, he figured out being a good family person, being a good citizen, being a good neighbor, it's just best for me, he thinks. It keeps me from being divorced and so losing a lot of my things, having to pay a lawyer, from all the drama of a furious wife taking my golf clubs and smashing in my car window like what happened with Tiger Woods. Keeps me free from STDs and going to jail for murder or for theft or being sued for slander. Keeps me out of trouble. Maybe he even looks at the big picture and thinks, you know, that living right makes the world a better place and he wants he wants that, particularly for his children he leaves behind. He wants the world to be a better place. Now, is such a person dead in his trespasses and sins? Yes, he is. If he's not doing those things out of faith in God. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Paul says in Romans chapter 14, verse 23. So one can be very moral and still living in sin. And so, dead. The dead person is unresponsive un and unable. He doesn't hear the word of God. Oh, he may hear the Bible read. He might hear a sermon preached. He might hear the gospel shared, but he can't hear God himself speaking through those things. He can't see. The eyes of his heart are not enlightened, as Paul prayed in chapter one. So he can't respond to it. It doesn't matter how loudly you say it, how brilliantly you package it. It's like shouting at a corpse. 
It does no good. He's dead. Now, being dead, he's unable. He's unable to do the work that God calls him to. He can't believe. He can't repent. He can't worship. He can't really do anything that God wants him or her to do. Nagging won't help. Motivating won't help. The problem is not a lack of will. As though, if only you could inspire these people to, to finally do what is right. To pray a prayer, to get baptized, to go to church, to give money, to read the Bible, to keep all the rules. Then they would be all right. No. Sure, the unsaved can physically be made to do all those things. You can bring them to church. You can raise them in those environment. But unless they are done with faith, those things do no good for them. And faith is only possible where there is life. And they're dead. So God commands work. Do the Ten Commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord with all your strength and mind and heart. Believe in Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There is work to be done. He commands all that work for you to do. You're commanded to believe the gospel. That's the work. Do you do it? But if you're under your trespasses and sins, if you're in your natural condition, you can't. You're dead. It's like looking for new workers. You won't need a new worker for your job, and you go to the graveyard. You're saying to the cold graves there, everyone who wants a job, come with me. Even if they can hear you, because they can't, because they're dead. They're unable to respond. They're dead. And that's what we do when we try to tell unbelievers just to obey God. You're telling them to do something they can't do. I mean, oh, sure, they can do the actual things. They can attend the church. They can actually read the Bible. They can pray the prayer. They can be very religious. But they're not really doing it out of faith and love to God. So they're not really doing what they're commanded to do. They can't do that because they're dead. And that they're dead to God, even if they're moral. Their hope, as the walking dead, is outside of themselves. But the problem gets worse. What is outside of themselves in this world and is working in them isn't helping them. People who are dead, Paul goes on in verse 2, they are following, Paul says, the prince of the power of the air. This is one of those rulers and authorities and powers and dominion that he mentioned in chapter 1, verse 21, over which Christ now rules. But those who are dead, not only are they dead in themselves, they are, they are still under that rule. The prince of the power of the air, that sa Satan or that satanic spirit is, is working, is working hard, making them walk in bad works. Speaking of work to be done, the satanic spirit is the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, in verse 2. So you understand how bad things have gotten. Not only are they dead, so unresponsive to God, they, they need outside help. But what they're getting from the outside is a spirit that makes them do bad things. So it is it's churning in them, agitating them, throwing more fuel in the fire of their fleshly disobedience. The poet William Butler Yeats wrote, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of a passionate intensity. Sometimes it seems that those committed to some kind of immoral cause have a, a furnace of a passion in them, propelling them to never stop, whether it be whatever cause, for, for racism. The Ku Klux Klan, in the Confederacy before that, had a, a satanic, passionate intensity, just totally unreasonable. They just fueled. Nazism, communism, Islamic jihad, gang members who can't rest until they do some bad work, like a drive-by shooting. It's like something is in them, just won't let them stop until they, until they do their evil deed. A spirit is at work, stirring them up to do bad things. Now, such people outside of Christ are sons, he calls them, of disobedience. Sons of disobedience in verse 2. See that in verse 2? Sons of disobedience, children of disobedience. Disobedience has begotten them. It's their parent. They're the children of disobedience. So like their parents, they disobey. It's in their family. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, disobeyed. They had only one law to break. Don't eat of that tree. And they broke it. And all of the rest of us from that time have been the sons and daughters of that disobedience, inheriting the guilt and the nature of disobeying. Okay, there's the guilt of it. There were, we disobey God's laws. That needs to be cured by 
transgressed his law, and there is the corruption, the evil nature that incurs God's wrath. That needs to be treated. Those two things, we need a double cure. In those sons, that sons and daughters of disobedience, a satanic spirit is hard at work. It's whipping them up even to even more disobedience. The spirit working in them causes them to work. It's their job, their identity. They're not just people who disobey. They are disobeyers. They work hard at it day and night, never stopping, 24-7, never taking a vacation, never taking a day off, never a rest break. They're disobeying with every breath that they breathe in unbelief. They disobey when they sleep in unbelief. When they wake and take a shower in unbelief. They eat breakfast in unbelief. They go to work all without faith in the Lord. All the time they are laboring for disobedience. They're employed by it and they're getting its wages. Death. So were we all in verse 3. See verse 3, among whom, that is among these sons and daughters of disobedience, we all once lived. Notice you were dead in verse 1. And here, verse 3, you once walked. It's past tense. Now things are different now, at least hopefully for you. In other words, we all live like them. We may have been moral, may have been raised in a great family that taught us manners and how to work hard. May have been dependable, may have been nice to others. We just weren't obedient to God. We weren't born a Christian. We were born dead like the rest of the world. And the world lives in the passions of, its, of the flesh. Now notice in verse 3, the flesh. A lot of people think they flesh, they think just the body. Just physical things, maybe they think sexual sin, and that's all they think of. But here, in verse 3, the flesh consists of either the body or the mind. You can live according to the flesh, either by following your body and its desires or your mind, your ego, your self-centered thoughts. That, that it, and sometimes that will make you willing, if you're following your mind, what you want in your ego, you're willing to sacrifice the comforts of the body for how you appear. Religious hypocrites will fast to appear spiritual. Look how spiritual I am. I fasted for so many days. They may give up foods and drinks that they like. To get a good reputation. Look how spiritual I am. I don't drink that. Other people will diet, you know. In the world they do that. They'll diet. They'll become anorexics, vomiting their food because the desires of their mind overcome the desires of their body. They want to be ultra thin. They want to be the supermodel. Or maybe they afflict themselves with exercise because they crave the athletic body. They'll train and train, sacrificing the comforts of their body because of their ego. And we see here the three enemies of the Christian in this passage. First is the world, because the course of the world are literally the age of the reigning spirit that, that just drives many people of this world. The second, the, the devil, the prince of the power of the air. And third, the flesh, that is the, the desires of the body and mind that rule the sons of disobedience, making them, what he says here, children of wrath. Children of wrath. That is, they are by nature, he says in verse 3. Notice that. They're by nature. Not something that they, that they were good boys and girls, but they, they made a few bad decisions. No, by nature, they are people who are born to get wrath. They're born to get God's anger, his furious punishment at sin. That's, that's their nature. Punishment is theirs properly. They disobey constantly because that's who they are. They're, that's their work. And so they have earned God's judgment, his furious punishment. And those aren't, aren't the, those aren't the people out there he's talking about. He's talking about us. That's the way we were, hopefully, for all of you, in the past. But he says, like the rest of mankind. In other words, like all people. Like, like they all are now. They are working. But they're doing bad works. But God, see that in verse four, but God, here's the great contrast. Here's the turning point. Everything has been pretty bad news so far. It's, it's gone as, as bad as it can possibly be. But God, the contrast, everything was dark in death. But God, there was, there's no hope for life. You're dead. But God. 
There was only sin in Satan. But God, our work had earned only God's anger. But God, the great breakthrough. We're dead. We're sons of disobedience. The spirit of Satan is at work in us. We're children of wrath. Then suddenly a work is done. Who did it? But God. Another way of looking at this passage, just step back. Again, it's one sentence, one long sentence, these whole 10 verses in Greek. One way of looking at it is take it apart grammatically. First, simplify it to its core. Subject, verb, object. The subject of the sentence, the one who's doing the work, doing the action. Well, here is God. The subject is God. He has to be the one doing the action at first because he's the one who's not dead. The verbs are in verse 5, raised up and seated us. Right? God raised up and seated us. Well, raised up and seated who? The object is, is you. In verse 1, are us. Here the you in verse 1 is the us in verse 5. You are or us. God raised you or us up. That's the core of the sentence. You were diagramming it. That's the one on the straight line in the middle. Everything goes off from there. God raised you up. He begins in verse 1 with the object, the one the action is done to. What about you? Well, you were dead. You followed the prince of the power of the air. You are sons of disobedience. You lived according to your flesh. And so you deserve by nature God's punishing anger. But you're no longer sons of disobedience. You're no longer children of wrath. We've gone from the death to life. Now, why? Because, because we had done something? Is that what did it? We did the religious works? We worked our way out of it? No, we couldn't, as Paul reminds us again in verse 5. Notice why he repeats it again, in case you forgot. Because as people dead in sins, we tend to flatter ourselves. To think, well, I'm, I'm not that bad. But in verse 5, he repeats it. We were dead in trespasses. We were unable. We couldn't believe or repent or obey. We couldn't do anything for God, really. We were incapable of that. We were dead. But God, who does the work? God made us alive. God raised us up. God made us. God worked. Now, why? Why did he do it? In verse 4, being rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy. He worked because of the great love with which he loved us. If our work says something about our identity, God's work says something about his identity, that God is love. He loved people who could do nothing for him because they were dead. Notice in verse five, he raised us up even when we were dead, unresponsive, unable to do any good work. Then at that crucial moment, with no hope in ourselves, the subject did the work. That is, God made us alive together with Christ. That is, when God raised Jesus from the dead, he saw us in him. What Jesus did for us in the cross and the resurrection, that gained for us life so that now you were, past tense, dead, but God made us alive together with Christ. That is, that is what God worked. He made dead people alive. And there can be no mistaking that it is, it's all his work. Notice how, how clearly, how repetitively, like he's a lawyer trying to close every loophole. He, it's all his work. So Paul even interjects, by grace, you have been saved. And in verse 6, he raised us up with him in chapter 1. We looked at last week, we saw that Christ is seated high above every, all the spirits, the powers of the air that impress other people, that carry them away to do those bad works we talked about. He's raised us up over them. So we should never be caught up in the spirit of this world. Those rulers that are at work in the sons of disobedience and worldly people, making them full of that passionate intensity for their sins. Jesus is over all that. And so we don't have to be frightened by other spirits. Here, Paul says that we are raised up with him. So that's our place. Raised up with him in God's eyes. And we are seated there. We're seated. We're sitting with him from God's point of view. We're seated because we're not working. We're, we're at rest. We're not working for our salvation. That's entirely God's work. Salvation is God's job. 
That's his employment. So much so that he identifies himself with it. The name Jesus, by the way, means the Lord is salvation. He doesn't want us, he doesn't want us trying to do his job. You ever get irritated when someone tries to do your job? Because they don't do it right. He doesn't want us trying to do his job because we, we can't do it right. We can't anyway, after all. To begin with, we're dead. We're sons of disobedience with a satanic spirit working in us, living for the flesh, conformed to the power of the world, people who are by nature incur God's wrath. Now, some argue, well, that can't be that total because we have free will, after all. But a person like that, dead, the satanic spirit moving them along, a person like that is always going to use his or her free will to walk in trespasses and sin. They'll always choose sin. But God resurrected us, raised us up, seated us over those spirits of the world because for those chosen for the foundation of the world, he will move heaven and earth to save them. And so their salvation is done. So you can be seated, stay seated, relax. It's done. The work is over. God has done that work in verse seven. Again, you look at the verse, verse seven, so that the reason, the goal, this is it. Why is he doing it? In the coming ages, in other words, in the future, he might show. He's going to show off. He's going to demonstrate like a trophy. You have a trophy, you show it, put it in a cabinet, people can see. He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That is, he plans on making us trophies, examples that prove his grace for ages yet to come. He will show us off. he will be saying, you know, these people, that they were dead in sin. The satanic spirit was working in them. They were children of disobedience, living for the flesh, by nature deserving eternal damnation. But now look at them. They're alive. They're seated with me. They're at rest. All oh, the grace that's so far beyond what we can describe, immeasurable, rich, grace in kindness. Now we who were salvaged from the junk of the world, we will be trophies that God can use for ages to come to show off how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. For, that is because, we'll make trophies of grace because by grace, you have been saved through faith. Now, here's some imagine, because we always like to try to find our work, something we can do. Imagine that, well, faith, aha, uh -huh, that's what I do, right? Finally, that's our, little, that's our little piece of work that we add to the mix. That faith is kind of the switch that we, we flip to turn on God's grace. They think it all depends. God does maybe 99% of it, but it still it depends on that little decision we make. If we choose to believe, we choose to have faith, they think. But now we should understand, wait, no, that's, that's not possible. And you know, without God's grace, we've already seen we're dead. We're living in sin. We're, we're sons of disobedience. A satanic spirit is working in us. And by nature, we're people who provoke God's anger. H how is such a person going to muster up the faith that it takes to turn on God's grace? He can't. He, he won't. He just will, will never make that choice left to himself because he's dead. Dead means he won't respond to the invitation. He d means he doesn't have the capacity. The, he doesn't have the life to do any such thing. A dead body has no power in itself to heal itself. A spiritually dead person has no power to heal himself, to, to, to believe, to repent, to love God. So how? How do we get faith then if we can't gin it up in our own hearts? We ought to answer that, didn't we? But God, God does the work. He made us alive. He raised us up by grace, which came to us through faith. And all of that, including the faith, was the gift of God. This is the gift of God. God gave us the grace and the life, and he even gave us the faith. We just take our seat. Our work adds nothing to it. This is not your own doing, he says at the end of verse 8. It is the gift of God. God worked it, and then he gave it to us. Like a father gives food and clothing and lodging 
to his children. Then in verse 9, because we're so inclined, it's naturally kind of people we are, inclined to think we work, we work for it. We add at least something to it. Our rule keeping, we think, must, must got to keep a few rules. Our decency, our prayer, our baptism, our free will, something has to come from us. Paul really bears down on the point. Our salvation, he says, is not a result of works. We don't earn it. If it depended on anything we add to it, then we could boast. We would boast, wouldn't we? Something about us is what it essentially came down to to make it possible. We would boast, I made the right decision. I prayed the right prayer. I went to the right church. I had the good sense to believe the right doctrine. I, I, I. But that's not how we got out of death. Remember? But God, but God hates our work when we think we can bring it to him and we can boast. We can claim our rights to salvation when something, he hates it when something in our hands we bring rather than to only the cross we claim. But God has determined to save that boasting all for himself so that for eternity he can say, I had grace. I showed kindness beyond measure. I gave my only son to make those wretches my treasure. Why? Why is he so intent that we do no work, that only he does it, he does it all? Why not leave us a little something to do, a little choice to make, a little religious chore you know, that we have to do for, to, to, to get that salvation. We can cooperate a little bit. Something we could add our two cents worth so that we could cooperate with God's, with God's work. You know, like the way we often get our parents, get their kids to do some chores around the house, even though they could do it themselves, but they, they want to give the children something to do. Why doesn't God do the same with us for our salvation? Why doesn't God leave us a little something to do for, to earn it? Because in verse 10, salvation is his job for because this explains why verse 10 why he doesn't want us to have anything to boast about here's the reason we are his workmanship get that we are his workmanship we're not his workers like many imagine we're not his employees we're his children we're his workmanship we're not the producer we're the product he's the potter we're the clay. He's the creator. We're the creation. And salvation begins in our experience with him making us a new uh, creation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We are created in Christ Jesus and what Jesus did for us through a perfect life. Death for our sins, risen from the dead. We are created new. That's our salvation, from death to life, life in Christ. And it's all God's work, not a result of, of our works, but it does result in our works. We go from the beginning of this amazing sentence, one long sentence, from dead people like zombies, walking in trespasses and sins and bad works, to living people walking in good works. Again, salvation is not a result of our works, but it does result in our works. So there's the bad works of the world, the flesh and the devil. And there is God, but God doing his work of making us alive. So we can sit. Finally, at that last verse, we are working and walking. We don't have to be depressed like unemployed people. We have an identity. As saved people, we have a job to do. Now, the job isn't to add to our salvation. We've already seen that we can't. That's done. God has done it all. He settled it all. He's doing the job. He's done the job and is doing the job of that work in us, working on us. But it is as good as done. And as far as salvation is concerned, we are seated. But as far as good works go, like loving all the saints he spoke of in chapter one, we are walking. We are created for the purpose of God's creation, good works. And that's now our job. Those good works don't do themselves. We now have saints to love. We have vans to drive. We have kids to be taught the gospel. Sometimes be told to be quiet, sit still. 
supervision to keep things in order, proclaiming his immeasurable riches of his grace to the guys who come here. We have kids who need a place to play. We have a sound system, sometimes needs tweaking. We have money that needs to be given so that we can do those things. We have people to be visited, neighbors to help, family to take care of. We have good works that God has made us to do, which God has prepared. He has put van driving opportunities, praying opportunities, teaching, leading play, our music opportunities before us. He has brought kids here so that we can teach them and give up, give us messes to clean, friends and family who need help or a kind word. God himself has prepared these good works. Let's not just pass them by. He prepared them so that we might walk in them. God loves and hates our work. He hates it when we try to use it to take glory away from him. Coming to him as if we can come to him with something in our hands to boast about. He loves it when it's the product, the fruit of his grace. When it is what he prepared for us. And we then walk in it. So don't be depressed. You're not unemployed. He's given you a job to do. He's already done the heavy lifting. He's lifted us out of death to life. He's raised us up. He's made us trophies of grace. He's seated us. Salvation is entirely his work. None of it is our doing. Nothing in our hands we bring. Now, if you've been raised up and they're seated in Christ, all you have to do is get up and walk. If you're not yet raised up, if you're still in your sins, pray that God would do that work now, that he would raise you up, and he would give you the faith. Let the water and the blood from Jesus' wounded side, which flowed, be of sin, your sin, the double cure, curing you of both wrath and making you pure.